Hello, my name is John Bernard. I'm the Superintendent of Schools here in North Reading, and I'd like to welcome you to this edition of Inside NRPS. My guest today is Dr. Patrick Daly, the Assistant Superintendent for the North Reading Public Schools. Patrick, welcome to the show. Thanks, John. I'm very happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have you, and I appreciate you being here today. So, Patrick, I thought it might be nice for you to introduce yourself to the community a little bit more. You've, you've worked in North Reading for quite some time, I know, but um, sometimes it's nice to remind folks uh, of the community of, of who you are, where you came from, and um, we'll talk a little bit about your role in the North Reading Public Schools today, but why don't you start by telling us a little bit about you. Sure. Um, grew up in Melrose, Massachusetts, not too far away. Uh, used to play North Reading in soccer. And uh, so it was kind of kind of fun coming back this way as an administrator. I was a teacher for several years. I taught English and uh, actually television production. I worked in a studio just like this for right. many years uh, when I was teaching in Waltham, and uh, came over as a assistant principal at the middle school at North Reading Middle School, where I was there for a year. And uh, as luck would have it, a position opened up in curriculum and technology, two of my passions, and I took that position on as director of academic services, as it was named. Um, and it's it's a similar role now, but but different. We've added a few things to it as I've become the assistant superintendent and. Uh, and I even got to call school one time, so I've, uh, I've done that as well. So I think I've uh, lived up to the assistant superintendent title with that one school call. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is one of the hallmarks, yeah. I think, of what people think we do as, uh, as leaders of the district. Is, uh, the, the snow cancellations are a big That's deal big. for sure. That's all you're remembered for. It really is. <laughs> And Patrick, this is your fourth year, correct, as the assistant superintendent? It is. It is, yes. So let, let's talk about that role a little bit, because that is a, a role that's new to North Reading. Sure. Uh, before you, there never was an assistant superintendent. As you yeah. said, you had served uh, largely, probably, in the, I think we could say, in, in the same capacity as an assistant superintendent without the title. Um, but certainly, we're doing the work. Sure. So what, what would you think, uh, if you had to capture kind of the overarching roles and, and responsibilities that you assume as the assistant superintendent. We talk about curriculum, we talk about technology, but you and I work very closely with each other and I certainly know that there's a lot more to the sure. to the job um, than just those two areas which are significant in and of themselves. But um, let's start with curriculum. What, what, what would you highlight, I, I guess, for the community as some of the, um, the major work and responsibilities that come under that umbrella of curriculum? Sure, so the curriculum part of the job um, I would say, so in our district, we have, um, we do not have the typical administrative structure. Like in Waltham, we had K to 12 leaders of each curriculum area, art, music, PE, English, math, um, and they were full-time administrators who, mm -hmm. who oversaw all the curriculum. In North Reading, what we have is, it's a great model of distributed leadership, teacher leadership. So we have 25 curriculum leaders, um, but they are all full-time teachers with various amounts of time off. Um, each month to do their work. So in some ways that's fantastic because they're full-time teachers, so they're so connected to the classroom, what's happening every day. Um, but as we all know, one of the huge challenges of that is they're not able to get out as much because right. they don't, and rightly so, don't want to be away from the kids. So very often I'm going out. Um, so a lot of what I do in my job is going out with the curriculum piece. I go to a lot of Department of Ed uh, meetings. And in a, small, in a small district, we always say this all the time, you wear a lot of hats. Mm -hmm. So in addition to, you know, in, in, in another district, you might have someone not only in the curriculum areas, but you might have someone who's in charge of English language learners. You might have someone else who's in charge of Title I. You might have someone else who's in charge of Title IX, another person who's in charge of curriculum. Um, I, I do all those things. So the Department of Ed, even in one week, I make a joke. I go out to Marlboro. I should get a, a room in the hotel, uh, like a condo in that hotel, because I'm there so often. Um, that's where they meet for a lot of their meetings right. and you go out and you learn there's going to be some changes to the accountability system or there's going to be a change to MCAS or there's new content standards in ELA and math and I'll go out to those workshops whenever I can I try to bring a few of the teacher leaders uh, along which is wonderful and then we come back and my job here is to communicate out what's going on to mm -hmm. the stakeholders so um, my mentor described that as a figure eight of leadership and that's what I try to to promote um, the idea being that you know I might go out and get some information and then bring it back to the content leaders who bring it to the teachers who bring feedback to me mm. um, and we get to speak because I don't always get to speak directly to every teacher um, so that's how our leadership system mm -hmm. works whenever I can though I try to um, I, I 
I was at a conference a few years ago, and uh, I saw former Governor Michael Dukakis speak. And the idea that I took from that conference was he called it a brown bag lunch. And he said, you know, right. sometimes you can accomplish a lot if you just tell everybody, hey, I'm going to be in the cafeteria in the corner. If you want to come over, bring your lunch, and we can talk about anything. So that's something I've tried to do. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard because I've been out so much, but I try to get to at least uh, each school at least a few times a year mm. and just anybody can come talk to me about anything that's on their mind from from licensure to curriculum to um, accountability testing um, everything that's out there so so like a lot of things there's yeah. there's pluses to a small district smaller district and there are minuses to sure. be in a smaller district some of the pluses you mentioned are we have the ability to uh, put teachers in leadership positions yeah. kind of the distributed leadership model that you mentioned yeah. um, we have a lot of face-to-face -face time with mm -hmm. with our teachers which we I think do. is a plus the minus might be that um, you're, you're out, you're kind of doing, wearing a number of hats, doing a number of jobs, so you sure. may not be able to kind of integrate with people as much as you might like, like you said, the brown bag lunch, and I know that that's something you have done. And we're in the schools, I think you certainly do a, a commendable job of getting into the schools and being around people yeah. and, 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 and hearing from them and also providing them with information. But in the end, as, and you've been in education a long time, I've been in it a long time, Education has evolved, and I think the responsibilities have certainly mushroomed. There's a, an awful lot more going on in schools, and I would venture to get, you know, I, I, I would go so far as to say much of that is good, the, yeah. the, the work that's going on. But when you work in a district of our size, we're kind of in that, I find like sometimes we're in that, that middle ground. I mean, it, we're not so small that we're able to easily manage things, but yet we're not large enough to have some of the supports that we might, might typically get in a larger district. But in the end, um, and I certainly see it with you, um, you know, we, we just want to get the job done and we'll do what we need to do to get the job done and you certainly do do that. Um, so a little bit, that was a little bit of a review of kind of the curriculum responsibility. Yeah. Let's talk about technology. Technology, I think probably everyone would agree, sure. is, is certainly a burgeoning uh, topic in our schools. There's so much kind of ever-changing um, new ideas coming into schools. Um, we've we've um, unveiled something very new this year with our, our grade seven students with providing each of them yeah. with a, a district issued Chromebook and you were certainly a, a significant leader in that initiative. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that sure. and, and what you see as the kind of the pluses for our for our students and our teachers with the one to what we call the one to one initiative. And also if there you know I might ask you some follow up questions we could talk a little bit more about some other kind of technology based initiatives that we have going on. So let's Absolutely. start with the one to one. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll just say, um, you know, for several years, I was uh, sort of in charge of curriculum and technology and, and, and other things. Um, and we had in the budget for a few years another position. And that came to fruition a few um, falls ago, about two years ago now. Um, we hired Dr. Downs to be the director of digital learning. Mm -hmm. And uh, since he's come on, it's been wonderful because so many things that I've wanted to do, I just couldn't do because I can't be in two places at once. So right. Dr. Downs has been able to take things in so many directions. And he and I speak um, daily, multiple times a day about all these initiatives. And we're His office we're is located much, we're right, together. right close to you. Yeah. So. And, uh, no, so we've been uh, developing this for a long time. Coming is the idea of a one-to-one. -one. And, and, and honestly... That's been around for many years. A lot of districts started going to one to one back around 2010, and um, when when we would get the question, well, are we going one to one in North Reading? What does that look like? What well, we'd always reframe the question a little bit and, and make sure you know it's not about the device, it's not about iPad, it's not about Chromebook, it's about how your instruction is going to be different. And quite honestly, when we went through the building project. Um, the building project being the construction of the new middle high school. Thank you for the new middle high school. We, we talked about a couple of things. One being, you know, we don't want to introduce one-to-one -one until we have the infrastructure. So the, the infrastructure that we talked about was, was twofold. One was the personnel. So we wanted the support people in place and the technology support in place. Dr. Downs, we've had digital learning specialists right. now at each school. Um, and also, um, you know, our, our technician kind of staff that we had in place, making sure that was squared away. And the other part of infrastructure is the, the wireless infrastructure. What we had at the time was um, not sufficient to really support a one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. So I did not want to invest in devices that would be glorified paperweights that would sometimes work, not work. When you have, when you have technology today, not even one-to-one, -one, it just needs to work. Correct. You need to be able to open it up, turn it on, get right. online, do what you need to do. And with all the fast-paced sharing of um, you know, collaborative documents, Google Docs, iPad apps, it just needs to work. So 
a major part of what we've done the last few years is obviously the building project. We got state-of-the-art Wi-Fi technology in the middle school, high mm -hmm. school. We wanted to make sure that we had that same expectation for elementary school because believe it or not, and you can see it, our kindergartners are using devices as much. There used to be a thought with technology that there was almost a trickle down. You know, the high school kids really use technology and then whatever they didn't need, a couple years old, it would mm -hmm. go to middle school and then a couple years later it would go to elementary. I know when I grew up that's how it was. Yeah. Um, you know, where you kind of got what was left over. the hand-me-downs. Nowadays, it's not the hand-me-downs. Right. The kids are as just as innovative in kindergarten as they are at high school Absolutely. in different ways. And so you, you've seen that when you get into the classrooms and with our digital learning presentations. So getting that infrastructure at the elementary school. So a lot of last year was spent, um, we worked on a grant. We got a significant contribution um, from the state sort of one time uh, from the grant to offset what was assisted by the mm -hmm. large cap um, the CIPC in town, which was wonderful to get our um, elementary schools up to that same level. So if you don't mind me, just pa sure. pa hit yeah. the pause for a second. So because I think this is significant for the community yeah. to fully understand. So we're not a community that often is fortunate to receive grants because demographically we don't always kind of fit the mold of what yes. the state might be looking to do. But you and uh, our director of finance and operations, Michael Connolly, and yes. Dr. Dan Downs, yep. director of digital learning, did an extensive amount of work last year to secure Correct me, about one hundred and thirty thousand dollars from the state. Uh, yes, from the state through yeah, a grant that supplemented some funds that the town contributed through yeah. the capital improvements plan to allow us to significantly upgrade the wireless infrastructure at our three elementary schools. Mm -hmm. Would you would you say to bring them on par with what we have at the middle high school? It is okay. It's so state for, of the art. so that yeah. that that's a significant. I think not only yes. for what the educational value is, but also for the financial assistance that we received through a grant. So if I if I heard you correctly, and, and for the benefit of the community, to to have un, to have unveiled a one to one initiative any time prior to the new middle high school being completed would have really been foolish because we would have not had a building that the infrastructure, the wireless infrastructure, would have, would have supported. Is that right? That that was that was our belief, and I would agree to that I, to this I day. Certainly, having um, lived it alongside yeah. of you, I think you were absolutely yeah. right. We moved into the middle high school as a middle school in 2015. We mm -hmm. moved into the high school in 2014. Right. So we had the 15, 2015 was the transition year of the move. The 2016-17 school year became the pilot year where mm -hmm. you led um, teachers working with the Chromebooks in a pilot model and that in, we, seventh grade. in seventh grade. Mm -hmm. We've now introduced that full-fledged in grade seven for the 2017-18 school yep. year with every student in grade seven receiving their own school district issued Chromebook. And what, what has been your, we're two months into the new school, you know, how would you assess the, um, the effectiveness and, and, sure. and the growth of that, success of that pro, uh, project? It's been, it's been excellent. And what we've seen and what we're seeing from teachers um, has, has been wonderful. So the digital learning specialist, Joanne Coughlin at the building, Daniel Downs as well, the principal, Kathy O'Connell, has been um, collecting evidence from teachers, stories that they're telling and new projects that they're doing. Um, we, had, we had an essential question, something we do in education, and the question was really, what's going to be different about our instruction and our student learning mm -hmm. now that we have the device? Because otherwise, you know, low level would just be substitution. Instead of typing a paper, I'm sorry, instead of writing a paper by hand, I'm going to type a paper. That's not what we wanted. Right. When we started asking the question, you know, what, what can we do that we could never do mm -hmm. before now that every student has a device? You know, and you start getting to think about, um, you know, some of the projects that aren't capable, that you weren't capable of producing. Uh, the, just the ability to be able to, to know at any time um, the computer lab's not going to be booked and, you know, mm. you can use those devices. And I think it's important to understand, too, with a one-to-one, -one, it doesn't mean that the students are using the device 24 hours a day, every day. They're not always connected. But I Correct. think we also know that in the world we live in, the Internet is a huge part of our job. Just having gone through a power failure for a few days here, I'm well aware of what happens when you don't have uh, access. Right. And I think we all say, well, what did I do before I had the Internet, right? So I think it's important to know that, that those devices are there for our folks. But I think one of the best things but we they did, don't replace everything. They don't. They supplement. No, nope. and it, you know, it, it, we still like to read a hard copy of a book as mm -hmm. much as look up something online. And I think that's part of the lesson we're teaching our students too, is it's there, but it's not, you don't have to use it for everything that you mm -hmm. do, but you could use it, the possibility, in every subject. And that's right. what we work and on. And it is, and they are being used. And they are. Significantly. I mean, I so. see it. We, yeah. Our offices are located in the middle high school yeah. campus. We see it walking through the school visiting classrooms. And I'm not aware of any technological issues with the Wi-Fi, with the getting no, on, this no. and that. And those devices could be used for testing in the future, and that 
all is worked out well. And the idea the is that the seventh, our current seventh grade students would have that Chromebook yes. for their remainder of their middle school and their high yeah. school experience that's in North the, Reading. That's and, the idea. And each yep. year we would add a grade. A grade. So over so, the next seven years, we're looking at, well, we piloted one year, so we would now have every seventh grader, eighth grader, ninth grader, all the way through high school over the span right. of the next six years with their own school district issued uh, Chromebook. Right, so the, the main plan is seventh grade, and we chose that for a number of reasons. Um, that grade level was, was ready for that. And I think doing the pilot has worked so well because it's really about preparing Absolutely. the teachers for the students. The students are going to come in knowing how to do all, a lot of these things. Yeah. It's really asking that question of the teachers, what mm -hmm. can we do differently? So the eighth grade has been very receptive. I've heard uh, wonderful things about the eighth grade teachers and how excited they are to be um, doing a pilot this year, and then they're going to have the students next year. And then that pilot will advance to high school, and we think it will, we will see, I think, some of the, the learning curve uh, increase at high school because a lot of the teachers of ninth grade also will have 10th and 11th and 12th grade mm -hmm. classes, so those same teachers will have already been through that pilot, so we think that um, it will sort of uh, increase as we get up there. So we're very excited about that. Not to, you know, I think it's always important to say too, it's not that we've forgotten about sixth grade or elementary school, um, but we're sticking at this time with our CART model at that area, and our goal is to increase the, the number of devices at that area. So with the CART model, um, you essentially have carts at your disposal at mm -hmm. the schools um, to, to take out as needed. And since um, we don't have the expectation that students have them with them every day, the cart model has worked out really well. And, you know, I think we can always use a few more carts, but again, to go from no devices or just right. one computer lab for 25 classes, mm -hmm. um, you now have... You know, every class computer labs computer there, and you have four, and the idea is right, the, the cart pushes right. in. So, we've started with we have four at each school. Batchelder is a little bit bigger. They, you know, we want to make sure they have a, something else to complement the number of classes they have. But we want our goal is to maybe mm -hmm. double that or increase those numbers so that sure. you've got more options. So, essentially, whenever a teacher needs a cart or a computer lab in their room, they it's available. It. Right. You know, it's not going to be every single period. And with those digital learning specialists at the buildings, the idea is that there's time when they, the teachers bring their kids to the computer lab, but there's also times when they push into the classroom. And it's this gradual release where, you know, once you've co-taught with the digital learning specialist for a while, you might not need the person in the room with you. You right. can do the lesson, and that person's more of a consultant, and they're off helping someone else. Mm -hmm. So that's the model we're working towards. It's really building the capacity of every teacher to be running a fully operational digital learning classroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're and well on our way to we're meeting well that. We're well on our way. We have some excellent hires that we've made. Like I mentioned earlier, we went from having, when I started, there was only one digital learning person in the district. Joanne Coughlin was at all five schools. We right. added, you know, our plan was always to have one at each school. We added a second. Um, and we've now added, um, we have three additional folks, one at each elementary school, and we have uh, two other folks that are, that are filling that role at, at district-wide, which district is fantastic. Level. So we're very happy with that. Right. And they're very heavily integrated into our schools. We they see are. their work yep. um, widely. We yep. see presentations at school committee meetings when we um, host school committee meetings at our five schools. Um, it's, it, the, the, the progress, in my estimation, has been significant at a very short span yeah. of time. It's a model that's worked well. It's the a model, model that's model well works well, I agree yeah. with you. Yeah. I want to go back just a second because you talked about, um, I think you wanted to try to you know, make the point that there's not a gap in the elementary schools yes. um, and, and, and that there is a significant availability of technology there, mm -hmm. although we are, I think we've done a lot to add, but we, we are still looking to add some more. I think we also want to make the point that there's also a significant amount of technology on the other end at our high school. There is. Uh, beautiful, you know, beautiful campus with the mm -hmm. middle high school shared, um, you know, as part of the construction project of that, of that um, facility, um, we were able to acquire a number of um, Chromebooks yes. and, other, and other devices um, to outfit um, the, the high school for, for our students. So um, I think it's important just to make, make it known that while we've piloted the um, one-to-one -one initiative in, in grade seven last year and now full-fledged this year, yeah. Um, I think the bookends of that middle school with the elementary and the high school are also you know, pretty well accommodated Absolutely. as well. I'll just say that's part of why we started the middle school pilot. First of all, we think seventh grade is just a kids are very receptive to learning was. at that age. Device-wise, though, and with the high school schedule, they were, we, we actually put a lot of carts at the high school. And with the schedule, we actually had better coverage because of the way the schedule is. You know, you're in this class for 78 minutes, and there's, there's not as many... Um, 
people competing for the devices. Mm -hmm. So, for example, our entire math program, we're able to use the computers, and they felt with the addition of, um, I think it was two carts we had to add, they were able to cover all their math classes mm -hmm. based on what we already had at the school. So the, the high school is really well covered, and it's only going to get better as the, as the students move up right, with the devices. Right, so. right, good. So we've covered curriculum, yeah. we've covered technology. I want to talk about probably uh, one of, of many other um, kind of hats that you wear, Patrick, and that's professional development for our staff. Yes. Um, you also lead um, the coordination of all of our uh, professional development initiatives, both in district and out of district for our, for our teachers. And um, I think it's nice for the community here to hear, and I'd want, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about um, your work with the, uh, what we refer to as the NPEN group, the Northeast mm -hmm. Professional Educators Network. Yes. Um, Something that's fairly new, um, year three, are we in year three We're now? We're in year three. We're yeah. in year three yeah. now with um, you collaborating with kind of people in a similar role to yours in other school districts, um, providing professional development across, um, across all of those participating communities. We happen yeah. to have um, an NPEN event coming up next Tuesday, but yeah. that'll be November 7th um, if, for those that um, might see the show after it being on live. Um, so that's coming up pretty quickly next week. Can you talk a little bit about what that is and sure. why, how it came to, to be, because I think the, the reasons why it was developed were, are important yeah. to hear about and also um, kind of what the goals are for it. Absolutely. I'll, I'll just say, I'll start by saying professional development is one of the main drivers to get me into this um, position. I've always wanted to change. I was always frustrated with the professional development I received as a teacher and some days were good, some days weren't so good. Um, wanted it to be better and it's I've realized it's taken me being in this role for so long to finally get there. It's like uh, being a head coach or something. You have to build a few years and then mm -hmm. you have to get there. And it, there's so many things that have to align in order to get the professional development where you want. When we talk about the one-to-one, -one, we talk a lot about personalized, individualized learning for students. And so a big uh, push that I'm uh, trying to usher in this year is that same modeling of professional development being personalized for, for educators. So educators have their goals and they have their content area specific needs. And then there's also things that we need to communicate to them from the state or maybe a safety initiative or things like that. But we want to make sure that in addition to coverage of important things, that educators are able to explore what's important to them mm -hmm. so that they can become the best educator they can right. be. And then model that by allowing their students to explore personalization, which the one-to-one -one program and other types of instruction allow. So NPEN sort of epitomizes this because for years we've had this question, and I've talked to um, our former superintendent, Kathy Willis, who was an assistant superintendent for many years. She said this has been going on for years, um, this idea of trying to bring together multiple districts to focus on professional development for low incidence teachers. So when I say low incidence, I'm thinking of art, music, physical education, English as a second language. So for example, in our district, there's only uh, 1.4, so essentially two people that are in the role of English as a second language. Mm -hmm. So if I brought in professional development for them, I'd either have to pay a lot of money for two people or they would be asked to sort of piggyback, why don't you go with math today? Why don't you go with English right, today? Which right. is good because that's part of their job, but it's not really focused on being an English as a second language teacher. Mm -hmm. But if we bring together 20 districts, some with five ESL teachers, some with two, some with three, some with six, now all of a sudden you've got 25, 30 people. We're going to have 113 ESL teachers at North Reading High School um, next, next Tuesday. We're going to have some really important PD that's so specific, and it's really exactly what they need, and it mm. meets their needs. So one of the huge logistical things that actually took us a couple years to coordinate was um, finding the day. And so many districts, the only day that they have, some districts only get one professional development full day, yep, yep. and it falls on election day because they have to close their schools for voting. Mm -hmm. We don't have to close our schools, and we actually, since I had been here, hadn't taken the election day for the PD day, but it took us a year to get our calendar aligned to make that our day. If it wasn't our day, we could still send people, but then you'd have substitute coverage and all those pieces. Mm -hmm. So it was getting all of the districts. And now most of those districts now take Election Day as their day, and we say that's going to be the day. We call it the NPEN Day. Mm -hmm. So I send our art, music, PE, guidance, foreign language, um, and many other um, low-incidence areas out. We are hosting, and we have now for the second year, this will be English as a second language, 
our BCBAs, our Board Certified Behavior Analysis, mm -hmm. and the paraprofessionals um, from multiple districts come to us. So we offer specific so workshops. we're hosting geared for those them. So folks. we're hosting over 400 people. Um, NPEN is, the registration today is about 2,200. Great. Um, which, is, which is really, it's grown every year. We had uh, a good problem to have this year. We had such high mm. demand. We had to actually shut down registration, make sure everybody could get in. Um, and so roughly how many communities is that? I'd say 25 to 30 25 is probably to 30 where different we are. Communities, yeah, because right? yeah, we keep growing. And it goes as far as, you know, I'm thinking Air Shirley, Groton Dunstable, that, you know, Westford, that, that area, and then mm -hmm. all the way up to Gloucester, you know, and uh, as down far as Saugus, Melrose. Mm -hmm. So it covers quite a, quite a uh, large area. And so my colleagues uh, and I have worked, we meet regularly, you know, monthly. This time of year, it's, it's, we're on the phone mm -hmm. constantly, daily, trying to plan this. There's a lot of moving pieces and a lot of people are involved. And a lot of our teachers, and I refer to our teacher leaders, um, I think of, you know, Brett Kunz, our art leader, and Beth Weiss, and Claudia Brown was very much involved. Daniel Downs is involved, our digital learning folks. They, they come together with the other content areas to say, hey, what would teachers in our departments like to see? Kim Smith at the library has been great with the library media piece, so, um, and, and others that I'm sure I'm forgetting. But we've had a lot of North Reading input in shaping mm -hmm. what these days look like. Some of our folks then present. Um, but they also participate. We have a couple of our paras and even a couple of our teachers um, who are going to stay and, and work with our paras and some paras from other districts offering some great workshops. So I'm really excited about it. I was going to speak about the paraprofessionals because yeah. I think years ago they were almost... I hate to say it, but they were almost a forgotten group. That professional development really wasn't um, at a level I think that really was affording them an opportunity to grow professionally. But I think yeah. that's changed. And it I, is. I know you've received some good feedback from our paraprofessionals yeah. in North Reading, and I'm sure from other communities too. But um, yeah, yeah, you I'm know, excited. We're valuing their work, we value their positions, and we're trying to give them meaningful professional development that will help them grow. And I think that's been a, another positive byproduct of the work that's gone on with NPEN. We are one of our. Um, Gina Sacco, our new um, special education administrator, is going to work on something for paras about the inclusion guidebook. Um, one of our, Diane McGuire, one of our own paras is going to offer technology Great. for paras. Um, there's another workshop that I'm excited about that's, um, it's sort of, so you want to be a teacher, because we have so many paras in our district we do. who are aspiring teachers. Mm -hmm. Um, some, some of our paraprofessionals are coming to us with master's degrees looking mm -hmm. for a job. True. Um, but I think, so this, this uh, workshop is being taught by a teacher in another district who was a para. So she went through those, and mm -hmm. it's everything from licensure to college to courses. To, so um, I think that's great. And then also, obviously, some real focused topics about um, working with uh, special education uh, specific situations, sure. students. Um, Where many of our paraprofessionals work. Right. So the, again, there's there's hundreds of paraprofessionals from, from multiple districts, Great. and uh, mm. we're looking forward to that. So this is year three. It's kind of a well-oiled machine at this point. Things are going smoothly. Uh, it's, 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 <laughs> it's very, a lot of people. very interesting. The bigger it gets, the more confusing yeah. it gets. And I think we're pushing, the, we're doing everything for free on Google. There's no overhead because it's all... Um, time that administrators like myself were all chipping in our giving, own time yeah. but it's getting a little bit uh, cumbersome just with the you know we're pushing the limits of what the google um forms can do for okay. us because uh so many people you know, you're just seeing the numbers sure so, yeah. sure so we got well, some, been, it was great the last two years and i have every every expectation it's, it's it will very, be again next week so thank you and, good and for and you very well received and i think a lot of people uh the the feedback is off the charts good. people just saying for the first time in mm -hmm. my career, uh, someone's thinking of me. And, you know, we have one ceramics teacher who now can take a course with exactly. five, ten other ceramics teachers and actually bond and, and talk. Don't you and, ne and networking. Networking well, is that's, a big piece I was just going to yeah. go there. There's, I think there's just some natural yep. uh, growth that yes. comes from just talking yep. to people in other school districts about what they're doing Huge. in a job like yours. And yep. I've seen know, a the networking, as you say, is, yeah. is good. I've seen a lot of educator goals coming back. Hey, I learned this at MPEN, and we've connected. And, Great. And, uh, you know, our foreign language department has done a great job connecting with yes. other districts and coming mm -hmm. up with ideas, and, and that's, that's how we grow. It's, you know, you, you, there, there's a lot of knowledge in North Reading. Our teachers have a lot of knowledge, but it's good to get out, too, and say, it hey, is. I like what they're doing over there. Mm -hmm. Why can't we do that it's here? It's sharing, and, 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 and it's and, what and we're it's, doing and learning from others what exactly. they're doing. Exactly. They're coming doing some walks here and, and walking away with some great ideas good. as well. So, good. Yeah, we're very proud of it. So that's a big we're day on proud. November yeah. 7th. So follow us you. on... Twitter, hashtag NPENPD, so N-P-E-N-P-D, 2017. You can follow us there. So, Patrick, we're, we're taping this show. It's November 1st today. Um, 
MCAS student uh, state, statewide student assessment that was administered in the spring of 2017. Our, our families will be receiving student score reports later this week. Yes. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, about that. We, we've had some significant changes go on with the um, with the MCAS test, which is uh, you know has been around for a while, over two decades, and I think. You know, there was there was a, a, a kind of a more, you know, my assessment of it would be a more rigorous, uh, more up to date um, assessment administered to students last spring in grades three through eight. While our high school tests um, have have remained fairly fairly the same, but due to be experiencing a change very shortly, 2019, if I'm not mistaken. Current ninth so, graders. Yeah. Current ninth graders. So, if we could, um, let's talk a little bit about. From your perspective, as someone who works, you know, intimately in the curriculum realm and also with assessment, about what parents might might expect to see uh, when they receive their child score report in a couple of days. Sure. So you're going to see in, in grades three through eight, which is what we'll focus on. It's called uh, we've referred to it as MCAS 2.0 or Next Generation MCAS. Um, you're going to see some some differences. Um, the the main difference that you probably see will be the 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 headings themselves. So what was called advanced proficient needs improvement and then warning failing. Uh, we now have exceeds expectations, meets expectations, partially meets expectations, mm -hmm. and then not meeting expectations. And it's not a direct crosswalk. So what was scored proficient before, you're going to see some of that in the column of um, meets expectations and then some of it in partially meets expectations. And that's that idea of sort of the higher, uh, more rigorous standard. Mm -hmm. When you look across the state, you'll see that there's nearly a 50-50 split of students who are sort of above the proficiency line, but it's now would be meeting expectations or exceeding, and then about 50% below, which yes. is a huge difference from where we were at, sure. at the end of what we'll call the legacy MCAS, where you're talking you know, almost 90% of the students in that uh, mm -hmm. upper, upper bar. And so they've... What we're going to see a lot of and what we're going to talk about more in the coming months is, you know, they've really reset, they've hit the reset button. It's a new benchmark. Um, our accountability system is reset to this year, everyone receiving no level, just about everyone receiving mm -hmm. no level. We're going to get a new formula for that in the, in, in the winter and spring to see what, what the factors are going to be and the variables for accountability. But it's really the reset button there, and it's really the reset button for MCAS. It's a new test. I think that there are still connections, and you can... Um, link some things to the past, but the, the, the commissioner, um, the acting commissioner, has really said it's, it's about starting over, and we're not, we're not trying to look and look at last year and connect it to mm -hmm. this year as much. We want to start, start from scratch. Things. Although, would it be fair to say for our high school students, yep. our current sophomores and juniors who took the uh, tests yes. last spring yes. as freshmen and sophomores, is it fair to say that they're analysis, comparative analysis, would be an apples-to-apples apples comparison, yes, high yes. school only. Okay. So, yeah, my, my focus, I'm speaking Was about 3 to, eight. to eight. For the current 10th grade, it's going to be the same, and the focus will be the same. The test is the same. The mm -hmm. standards they're being assessed on, um, and everything will, will be the same. And what's called the competency determination, what they need to do in order to graduate high school, Correct. is all the same. Some of those things will change now moving forward. Mm -hmm. So the reason why the freshmen are going to be the first to take it um, next year is because we didn't want the first time a student had seen next generation MCAS to have been um, in 10th grade when it when it quote unquote counts for graduation right. so right. the current ninth graders took the new next generation MCAS last year as eighth grade mm -hmm. and um, and so that's the plan so they will be uh, ready for that and prepared they will have seen it they will have um, received a score report all those pieces mm -hmm. um, with the eighth grade assessment. So that's a good thing. Um, the, the test, a major, another major shift obviously is the fact that this test is going to be a computerized test for everyone. Correct. Computer-based yeah, test. Right. At this time, um, we're, we're doing several grade <clears throat> levels. We did two grade levels last year. We've now added two other grade levels this year, plus the sixth grade because of our Wi-Fi and all those things we spoke about being ready. Um, the test really is designed and it's most efficient and the students actually prefer mm -hmm. taking it online. It's easier logistically for us to administer it online. And so sixth grade, um, the middle school felt that they wanted to do six, seven, and eight. So right. we're going to be doing that on a uh, computer this year. Mm. And it, the te when you look at the test, anyone that's taken the test on paper, you, it feels like you're taking a computer test on paper and you realize, oh, this would be so much better if I was doing it on the computer. And 
uh, there's absolutely a learning curve with that, just students having to be able to type and to be confident. Mm. But, but again, with all the devices that we're using, students are building those skills. They've built up an experience. And those are skills that students need to learn anyway. Right. You know, there's no right. job they're going to go into where they don't need to use a computer exactly. to type something up. So we're going to build those skills anyway, mm -hmm. and then they'll be prepared for it for testing. It's not like the testing is driving, driving that, that they need to be on computers. Sure. We already know they need to be on computers. Mm -hmm. But the state is aware, and they actually this year for the first time have developed sort of a, a, a scale um, to equate the computer-based scores and the paper-based scores because I, I believe, as I, I would guess, as students are learning to take it on a computer, the scores won't be as high as the paper that they're accustomed to. So they've balanced that out for the, for the grade levels where there were enough students taking paper and computer, mm -hmm. and they did balance those out, which is, which is good. That it, was good. It, that was an advantage. It is. In, in our district, it didn't uh, quite apply because we only, last year, we only did the mandated, essentially mandated grades mm -hmm. um, last year. So we're in a good place with that. It's a new assessment. Parents are going to see um, some different scores. Um, than they've seen before, different categories for scores. Mm -hmm. um, and overall, we're, we're pleased with our scores. North Reading traditionally does very well on Correct. testing. That yes. hasn't changed. We're still in a very good place. It just is going to look different it's to It's going to look a little bit different. And I think, um, you know, I think there's always room for improvement. We always look at our scores. You know, you compare yourself to the state. We like to say in North Reading that, you know, we always want to be much better than the state because um, we're, we're a high-achieving district. Correct. I think more so than ever, though, this year, when you look at what the state, as I mentioned, across the state, 50% above, 50% below, I think you're going to start seeing that, at least in the baseline year, it's going to look, you know, being a little bit closer to the state is going to be typical this year right, for a lot right. of districts. Correct. Um, so, obviously, as we look to improve, we look at those areas where we're either at or below the state and mm -hmm. say, well, that's what's going on there. Let's, let's, let's fix Analyze that. Analyze that a little but, further. But overall, we're, we're in a very good place. Are, you know, we like to look at our, you know, how many students, what percentage are at exceeding or meeting um, mm -hmm. at the, the grade level expectations, and uh, we're, we're in a great place. And the data coming back numbers. to us to analyze, to make yes. adjustments where we need to is very different and more, I think, more in line with what we were hoping we would get to yes. be able to zero in on areas where we think we might need to be doing better or more work to, to help students improve. So right. that's, that's also, I think, a, a, a kind of a good byproduct of what's what's been a change test now for it, particularly the elementary and middle school. It should be. And, they, you know, where in the past, especially during the transition with all the different tests, when a teacher would go to figure out, well, the student got question 16 wrong or 20 students got question 16 wrong, what was question 16? Right. It wouldn't tell you. It's now like, this is not being released. Data. Now at the very least what they've said is even if it doesn't give you the question, it'll give you the exact, it'll mm -hmm. say it's, it's um, subtraction of three numbers or whatever it is so that you can come up with a similar problem to give students to practice so that they can Correct. make sure that they're learning that. Good. So it's, it's good. We always say, you know, MCAS is very important. We take it seriously. The scores are very useful to us to understand where we are as a district. And, you know, it's, I've always said it's not really a test of the students, even though we get the individualized scores. It's really a test of our curriculum mm -hmm. and how we're doing and what things we need to change with our curriculum or instruction uh, to make sure students are learning. But again, it's also only one data and in point. In the end, you it's know, one measure, it's, exactly. It's, you know, it's a few days of testing you know, over a short period of time. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we always try to keep that in perspective. Mm -hmm. I think North Threading as, as, a, as a community keeps it in perspective. I We're agree. proud of our scores, but uh, we know that there's many other you know. No, I think you said it well. We take it seriously. Things. We work hard. We make sure that we're meeting the demands yep. of, the, of that exam, but we don't. We don't focus solely right. on it. We don't, we don't drive instruction around the demands of the test. And I think that's always been the case and I think should continue to be the case. Agreed. Yeah. And there's a public presentation for the school committee um, that will be televised coming up on November 13th to talk yes. a little bit more about, about MCAS yeah. as well. And we'll share out that presentation so anyone that wants to view it who isn't able to see it live mm -hmm. or, or on, um, we can, can watch it then Great. as well. Well, Patrick, you're a busy person. There's no doubt about it. Thank very you. competent person. Thank you. North Reading is lucky to have you. I'm very lucky to have you working alongside of me. Lucky to be Thank here. Thank you for being my guest today. Thank you so much. Thank you all.